So uh, next topic, um, uh, so again, kind of uh, moving up, uh, moving across the different type of uh, computing devices. So uh, next up is uh, data centers. And this uh, these systems have been a topic of much, much, much sort of news and research and all in recent years, mostly because uh, they constitute in a concentrated form, sort of very energy hungry uh, systems. I'm sure you would have read these articles like how they build these things where energy is cheap, they sort of con consume many, many, many megawatts of power and things like that. Okay, so, uh, so uh, in, a, in a concentrated form. And the interesting thing about them is that um, they kind of are a combination of two things. I mean, data centers are computers, but data centers are also buildings. And uh, you really are optimizing power consumption of the both together. So there are a lot of issues which sort of come up. You can think of them as really kind of very specialized building. So uh, data centers are collections of multiple servers and uh, a lot of networking equipment because there are so many computers, so they need to be interconnected. And of course, these things hook up with the outside world. Um, and uh, I guess uh, for a variety of business and economic reasons, they have been very attractive because essentially uh, you get to deal with uh, security and management and all by some sort of a third party. So that's kind of the uh, model which has become very attractive. Uh, and also uh, the idea is that they could be managed extremely well. So. Um, uh, there are obviously uh, at this stage uh, sort of companies which have their own in-house data centers, but then the more dominant model is that companies who are kind of using these to provide uh, software as a service or some variant of that model. So data centers are pretty unique uh, in the sense uh, that that is, it's not like uh, the single data center builder who just makes these things or even a few of them. Uh, every, uh, the companies who are in this business, they invest a lot and they keep improving. So Google has done a lot of research and their data centers are optimized in very interesting ways and ditto with Facebook or Microsoft or Apple. Uh, a big part of that reason, of course, has been energy related issues. Um, as we'll see, uh, eff efficiencies of data centers have improved quite tremendously in sort of recent years. So lots of research has gone into how to uh, sort of optimize for these things. In a typical data center, a very some common architectural ideas have emerged in a very typi uh, typical data center. What ends up happening is that they have this model where uh, sort of the floor is raised and then you have um, uh, the HVAC sort of comes through the floor, the hot air rises, gets sucked up out of from the ceiling and then kind of the whole thing circulates. And, uh, I'm sure you have seen these pictures with rows and rows of sort of cabinets. In each cabinet they have these very high density blades or racks and uh, then lots of, um, like I said, networking equipment but the other part also has lots and lots of power equipment as well and uh, uh, I think earlier in the course I had kind of uh, described also how instead of delivering electricity there are also ideas like delivering natural gas all the way to the um, uh, all the way to the racks those kind of things have been floating around so um, yeah, s certain common things have emerged but nevertheless uh, when the whole data center is designed uh, there are lot lots of sort of different innovations which are brought to bear some years ago um, uh, another concept emerged in data centers and which is called containerized data centers. And, uh, and, and this was first started by Sun, which is kind of part of Oracle. Uh, but basic idea is that they take these shipping containers, the very ones which go on ships and trucks and all, okay, so standardized size. And basically what they did was they built uh, essentially a data center module out of these containers. So inside the containers are computers, HVAC equipment, power supply distribution and all. And essentially you get these things parked in your parking lot and as long as you have electricity to drive it, you are good to go. So it's a self-contained uh, thing specifically designed. So the cooling system, computing, packaging, everything is kind of done. Um, so uh, it lets you deploy data centers very rapidly and also in certain settings it's, a, it's very attractive. So. Like for example, both UC San Diego and UC Berkeley have these kind of data centers. So they just kind of park them in a corner of the campus and they have a captive 
data center as opposed to kind of building, making a new building and stuff like that. So that model also sort of emerged. So trends in these things have been containerized or these portable or modular data centers where all the relevant things for a data center, so of course computers, but then power, as I said, power supply, HVAC, all of those things kind of come together in one well-designed uh, and companies sell this thing basically. So Hewlett Packard sells this and uh, Sun used to sell before uh, they moved out of it. So there are companies that sell this thing, you buy it, you have a data center on a go. Uh, so, uh, and then what you can do is you can, um, bigger data centers essentially get made by kind of assembling these things kind of together. So that's kind of the notion. Uh, now, having said that, uh, companies which are in the business of making large scale data centers like Apple, uh, the one Apple made in North Carolina, all, they are very customized and highly optimized data centers. They are not done this way. So, big part of data centers relevant to our energy story is the power and cooling uh, systems that kind of go into this. So, there's a whole bunch of stuff goes in there and part of it also is that since these are what are part of what we generally call as critical infrastructure, that is a data center going down is very bad. So, uh, there are a lot of redundant systems, backup power generators, stuff like that. So, in this complicated picture, you would see things like emergency diesel generator and things like that. So, these are, uh, th 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 there is a lot of stuff sitting there to take care of um, uh, uh, not just supplying the energy, but doing so in presence of uh, outages and stuff like that. Now, uh, driving these, uh, the data center design also in part has been that we are able to pack a lot, lot of electronics and that electronics uh, burns a lot of power. So the heat density, that, uh, that's, so, so while individual devices have been getting more efficient, but we're also packing a lot of them. So the overall, um, uh, uh, overall density of uh, heat generation and therefore the load in terms of heat removal and all have been increasing. And the consequence of that has been that if you look at overall cost of running these systems, uh, then it used to be that uh, sort of most of the cost used to be basically kind of computing equipment, the actual uh, servers themselves. And then uh, over time, it's the uh, heating and cooling which, uh, which began to rise and it's been kind of rise, rising up and up. So that's just a reflection of um, uh, that we are packing more stuff and uh, need to remove that heat. So if you look uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a data center and kind of its overall energy usage, which is kind of on the left hand side, so what you would see is that roughly, I mean, this is somewhat an old figure, uh, uh, but uh, roughly 30% was actual IT equipment and the rest is basically very broadly into two categories, the cooling and the supply, okay? So the actual act of supplying the energy itself uh, you lose power because of efficiencies and all, so the transformers, the winter to power supplies, PDUs, which are power distribution units, all of these things waste energy. Uh, and then uh, you have the HVAC that you put in there. And then this slice of 30%, if you kind of blow that up into a, Diagram, then within that you begin to see that CPU is roughly a third, um, memory is roughly a third, and the networking and the disks are another third. And some of it kind of would also depend upon the nature of the server you have. Is it a storage server or is it a compute server? Uh, so those things end up impacting. There's some data from uh, Google's data center. Uh, so firstly, companies are very, very, uh, KG about sharing these data. Okay, so there's very the amount of data which is really out there uh, in open literature is relatively less because uh, essentially uh, insight into this begin to uh, has economic implications in the sense uh, how efficient is your data center, what would be your cost structure, how how much would you be able to price your service, all of those things come into play. So they don't share these things easily. Uh, there's certain academic groups who work very closely with some of these things. So like Microsoft works very closely with a few companies, a few universities and Zitto, Google and all, but I mean, by and large, these are uh, uh, not out there publicly. So whatever sort of comes out. Uh, point is that same uh, 
similar structure that you would see in this case, I T is like this. More than thirty percent, but point still is that it's a smaller. Uh, this it's, it's only a fraction of the overall overall uh, uh, data center. So one thing which comes is that power related costs dominate. So uh, uh, just uh, uh, the, the way kind of the economic analysis, if you may work out, you all you are all obviously paying for kind of the capital equipment and that you kind of depreciate over a certain period of time and all, and then you are paying a runtime cost of power that you use for uh, running running this particular data center, and uh, what you uh, see out here is so in this particular case, after they kind of um, take care of the amortization and stuff like that, like uh, server are going to be there for three years, so you kind of account for that. Um, uh, what you end up with is something like this that roughly half the cost is actually going into things which are not your IT equipment related, but they are actually the running costs of cooling and things like that. Um, so, uh, power dominates uh, or, or power is a big factor that sort of you have to bring out and I guess making things sort of worse is that really uh, it's not like the single system is dominating so it's not like you can simply say okay I'm, let me solve the CPU power consumption problem and I'm done but it's, it's, it's almost like things are uh, divvied up roughly rough, equally a third there, a third there, a third there so uh, no dominant thing. It basically requires a lot of gradual sort of improvement in every aspect of the system. Uh, so a lot of work on energy in data center early on was actually done by folks at Google, and that concept of energy proportionality that I introduced very early on in the course came out of sort of that work. So if you recall, I had those plots where like servers are mostly idle and things like that. They all sort of came out of uh, the pretty famous paper on the folks at Google who uh, sort of highlighted some of these issues. And then uh, over the years, I mean, uh, lots and lots of uh, work has ha happened around, uh, in, around this thing. Uh, needless to say, uh, uh, the type of server you have, the type of load you are running, they also have a say. So like if you, uh, if you are, a, I don't know, like the supercomputer center at UC San Diego, the kind of load they face is very different than, let's say, Microsoft hosting a data center running their Bing and their other services like that. So, uh, so uh, fair bit of uh, fair bit of variability, fair bit of uh, uh, differences across across uh, these things. Okay, so uh, this is basically showing across the workload. Um, uh, fair bit of changes and then additionally the changes come because of the way we run these systems so we saw uh, things like uh, voltage frequency scaling shutting things down so workload has an effect as well as how we run these data centers so both of them end up with kind of a fairly uh, large uh, range of uh, power usage that we see application types so again uh, across the I mean, these are some standard things that and you see that applications have a huge impact. So all of these factors come into play. Some other things are, uh, uh, these are obvious, sort of obvious. There are other things which come into play, which is the underlying technology and the variations they introduce. Uh, so for example, this is some uh, work out of IBM. And what this is uh, showing is that uh, if you take uh, otherwise uh, identical processors, so these are CPUs, which are identical part numbers, uh, just you purchase multiple of them and what you see out here is that normalized to some particular value there's 10% variation there. So this is basically what I'm saying is that I have a data center with kind of n uh, blades in them and the power under identical uh, everything else being identical their cooling their load everything there's still sort of variation across them just because of the variations in the underlying manufacturing technology. So this is what in semiconductor uh, parlance is called uh, process variation and basically it happens because the transistors and all are not made identically. There are always some chemical or geometric uh, differences between the different devices that, that, that there are. Uh, this is uh, this is showing the same point which is um, different parts running uh, same workload and the power consumption they're doing. So in this case, 
some sort of a sort example and each one of these dots sort of correspond, uh, correspond to uh, the two different types of parts so the green one are uh, one particular uh, like uh, two gigahertz and the red one are different uh, but each red one is identical to each other and each green one is identical to each other and what you're seeing is a fair bit of variation. Um, uh, the variation manifests itself in both power and speed. So, uh, maximum power uh, for the same speed, the power you will see, uh, and for the same power, uh, the speed that is achievable. Then there are variations because of design. So, again, uh, uh, the way these data centers and all are designed is that there would be a spec, and then you would they are equipped with uh, processors and memory and drives and all meeting that spec, but they often are sourced from different vendors. And again, there are variations from that. So in this particular case, what we have are, I think these are DRAM chips, they yeah, so DDR2 parts. And uh, so they are spec identically, that is a DDR2 part, memory part from whichever vendor you have uh, is following the same spec, but significant variation. In fact, in its active mode power, you see that there is something to it one and roughly 50% uh, power uh, idle mode power and these are quite significant so again nominally identical part significant variations uh, there is uh, there is uh, a linkage which sort of we have seen earlier also, uh, also uh, linkage between how you cool these things and uh, the power they consume so uh, if you do not cool the chip appropriately it will heat up as it heats up, it burns more power and you kind of get into the thermal runaway kind of situation. So uh, every time, uh, in, in some senses, if you think in terms of I have a watt to spend, uh, you have to apportion it, some of it towards cooling, some of it towards actual computation and then balance uh, matters, matters quite a bit. So main observations um, sort of which come out and th these, these things kind of hit uh, data centers very aggressively because there's so much computation with high density that is going on. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so the main thing is that power management has to really done holistically in these things. You cannot just focus on CPU or something. It's kind of an overall system. Uh, the uh, second thing is that you have to account for the variability. So, you put uh, the same task running on a blade, blade number I on one rack or a blade number J, nominally identical blade, num another blade on a different rack, their impact uh, both in terms of power they consume uh, directly as well as the cooling they would require are going to differ quite a bit. So that's just the natural variation. And then there is of course the workload variation at different times of the day and all kind of just seeing different loads. Um, so um, a lot of work basically has gone on in making the power management within the data center to be such that it adapts to these variations, uh, variations in the workload and stuff like that. One big area of optimization uh, has been the actual power delivery infrastructure itself. Um, as we saw, roughly a third, maybe even more, uh, of the power goes simply into the delivery, so that is, uh, for every watt you are delivering to the IT equipment or to the cooling, um, you are sort of using a lot more out of the grid and all. So uh, these are very complicated systems. I mean, uh, data centers are literally kind of small cities. Um, uh, so a lot of stuff fits in there. Uh, obviously, lots of cabling, power distribution units. So these are kind of the equivalent of, sort of the edges of a power grid. Uh, uninterrupted power supplies, uh, backup generators, transformers, uh, local substations sitting right next to the data center, all of these things together kind of constitute uh, the power uh, system of a, of a large data center. So uh, <coughs> basically uh, sort of what ends up happening is that by, from the main supply, and this main supply obviously is gigantic, it's not like the kind of stuff that comes into our homes or even a few homes, it's really kind of megawatts of power and goes through a sequence of things by the time you are delivering something to a circuit 
corresponding to a rack. Okay, and a rack may have a few tens of blades. Each blade may be consuming, I don't know, a couple of hundred watts. So even a rack is pretty intense, uh, power-wise. But uh, all all these things sort of uh, come along the way. A uh, lot of them basically have to do with uh, coping with transient uh, outages and stuff like that. Also, so um, uh, so. Uh, these are the big elements, you know, switching gear, diesel generator, I mean, this is power supply, basically, with batteries, um, and uh, these power distribution units, which have breakers and stuff like that. So, uh, the, all of these things are designed with a high degree of redundancy, so which is part of the cost also, in the sense that uh, anytime you have a redundant system, it's going to consume some amount of baseline power. So that's what happens out here. So it starts from the very top, like for example, uh, they get power from perhaps more than one source. So it may be the grid, maybe two different grids, maybe uh, local solar farm or something like that. Okay. Then from the substation, redundant feed to the data center, and then within the data center, uh, UPS for short outages, and then diesel generators for longer outages, and so on and so forth. So it's a complicated, redundant system that they sort of create. Uh, uh, so at every stage, there is some loss of efficiency. So if you look at the overall pipeline, you know, the, so even ignoring kind of transmission losses and all, which is from the source where generators were located to the uh, by the time it's actually delivered to the data center uh, within the data center uh, power distribution unit so basically think of it like a big unit for the sake of time uh, the ups is uh, the power supply uh, in the rack the dc to dc converters which uh, regulate all of these things and you see these numbers they are kind of far away from hundreds so by the time you take the accumulation of these uh, this is why we end up having roughly 30% of the power actually is going into um, in, uh, is, is going into uh, the distribution. Uh, another way of thinking about it, that original pie chart I had, a third was IT equipment, a third was power supply, a third was HVAC. One way of looking at it is for every watt of computation I'm doing, I'm actually spending a watt in delivering that power. Okay, so roughly if you ignore the HVAC part, my actual efficiency is only about 50% of the rest. That's the even about here. So, uh, so quite quite inefficient, and of course, when you multiply it to the scale of uh, the amount of power data center consumes, uh, it's, 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 it's quite significant. It's quite significant, uh, not simply from a, from a societal perspective, but it's bottom, ultimately, kind of dollars that matter to the company. So, so uh, yeah, uh, this is another pic, uh, view of that loss happening at every every particular stage. So, one of the trade-offs, which uh, is, of course, you like to be energy efficient, but some of this energy efficiency uh, or loss of efficiency is happening because of uh, um, the high availability requirement that that exists. Uh, that exists in these things. So. Maintaining the uptime of a data center, you're kind of paying for all of this, and that's uh, part of it. Another part is these things are just huge, and therefore you have to distribute power. That paper we had discussed, uh, I presented earlier on on the natural gas, in part was basically looking at this. This was basically saying that look, all these efficiencies are removed if uh, we deliver the natural gas, and in that particular case, uh, they were using fuel cells right at the rack and kind of are doing a conversion there, it has its own inefficiency, but the case they were making was that all these inefficiencies are uh, much more than kind of the inefficiency that we sort of see in that process. So as you can imagine, uh, faced with these kind of losses, uh, people have looked quite a bit into uh, alternatives. In fact, uh, there is, I think, still an open price, uh, open price for a million or two million dollar on a very boring sounding part, but which is a high efficiency DC to DC converter. So one of the ideas that um, got 
uh, pushed around quite a bit and uh, some newer data centers have adopted is that instead of delivering AC power, so if you look at this model, what is happening is that throughout things are AC and then at the very end when uh, we hit up at the output of this power supply and this guy is maybe at the level of a rack, or, uh, sorry, a plane or a uh, rack server, maybe for the chassis, but some, I mean, certainly not more than a rack, okay. It's, it's, it's at its output that we then do our DCPPP regulator, but up to this point, everything is AC. So going back historically, uh, long ago, before AC power was invented by Nikola Tesla, things used to be DC. And then AC won out. So what was the reason? Losses. Losses. Okay, so uh, uh, DC was lossy. AC was viewed as uh, AC solved that problem. So you could do long distance transmission. Okay. But it turns out that high voltage, uh, 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 that that's not always the case. It depends upon the voltages you are transmitting. So your losses depend upon the current. If your voltage is low, you are going to have more current for the same power supply. So therefore, you're going to have more losses. But if you do high voltage DC transmission, then sort of things change. So what has hap begun to happen in recent years, not just for data centers, but in a lot of other contexts that people have begun to revisit this, that could we do very high voltage DC transmission and that is a more attractive proposition than doing an AC transmission. So, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the idea is that if you can do it, then you don't have to do all these multiple stages of conversion, okay? So in AC, what happens is we transmit at very high voltages on the long distance wires and we reduce so that series of transformers and then finally we convert to DC and then we do regulate that DC. So there are all these stages of conversion and each it is that conversion which also causes losses. So the uh, idea which uh, has emerged in sort of recent years is that let's do away with all of that, let's distribute DC and uh, thereby approach uh, uh, eliminate all these conversions. So basically we distribute power from the substation to the rack as DC. Uh, it is distributed at a much higher voltage than we would do the AC with, but uh, the idea is with that we reduce sort of a lot of uh, losses that sort of come. Uh, of course there are issues, so going again uh, you have to do, you have to have good conductors and uh, also change the way we handle things at the end point, but that's sort of uh, uh, the idea. So this concept has emerged in many other settings also, even uh, for buildings and all people are articulating this concept. So uh, part of the uh, attraction also is that as renewables come into place, so if you look at like uh, a solar panel, solar panel generates DC power. So how do we connect it to our grid? Well, we have to convert it to AC. And uh, what is something which converts DC to AC core? Like how do these solar panels get hooked up to our grid? The grid runs on AC. Vinay, you work in that, huh? Well, I, uh, no, you don't actually have a generator there, right? So, no. So it's a, it's a circuit called inverter, okay? I mean, cons uh, so this is what your UPSs do also, right? I mean, UPSs have little batteries, but they supply DC to your computer or not, right? So uh, they have to generate uh, AC signal. Uh, for things like UPS, if you were to, so AC signal is a sine wave, right? That's what we think of it. If you ever monitor the output of a UPS, you would see that it is far from a sine wave. It might be like a square wave or some pretty triangular wave or something like that. It looks actually pretty bad. So the disadvantage of that is uh, if if the signal is not a clean sine wave, that means essentially it has a lot of harmonics and that causes noise and stuff like that. So that would begin to affect things and all. So uh, when you have solar panels hooking up to the main grid, as 
currently, like for example, if you buy a solar panel at home, uh, you can always sell excess power back to the utility. Now you need a much higher quality system because if your frequency of the sine wave that you are generating is not right, or if it's not a sine wave, it's not a clean sine wave, all of this are going to dirty the power of the grid and it's going to cause losses and stuff like that. So inverters are what sort of make that happen. Uh, so uh, if everything was DC, I would not need to do that conversion back. Okay, I can just do everything in terms of DC and forget most of AC. So variety of reasons because of which uh, DC has become attractive. So DC has become attractive on long distance transmission uh, because uh, we can reduce losses, it turns out, by going very high voltage and making use of newer conductors, uh, as well as uh, within a building or within a data center. So uh, there are certain standards which have begun to emerge there also, but point upshot of all of these things is that within the data center now, instead of AC power coming to your back and then you converting it to DC edges, you basically do the conversion to DC way out there, perhaps even at the substation, and then you distribute a high voltage DC all over the data center and eliminate a lot of those conversion uh, and related losses that, 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 that you end up having. So, and it also simplifies things like you don't need a transformer and stuff like that and also cost reduction as well. So this, uh, DC-based stuff, I think some of the newer data centers from Google and all are kind of like that. So back to my thing. So uh, DC to DC regulator, uh, this little piece is, uh, is efficiency matters quite a bit now. And improving these efficiencies uh, has been the subject of many prizes. And like I said, there's something out there which I think it's funded by Google, if I'm not wrong, or it might be X Prize or something like that. But basically, they have pretty stringent specs: how much power it has to handle, how much, how much it can heat, and stuff like that. But the point is that uh, there's a lot riding on it. Improvements there can have huge ramifications because they get multiplied by every blade server which is out there. So, um, yeah, so that's one. Uh, the uh, change which has been happening, moving towards DC, okay, away from AC. Um, other issues. So uh, another another issue which comes up so is uh, uh, the concept of stranded power. So kind of the idea is the following. So you uh, you are establishing a data center. You are buying the servers. The server comes stating it's 400 watts. Now what does that mean? Uh, so when you buy a computer, it has a power rate. What does that mean? Is it the average power, peak power, critical peak power? Uh, I mean, what's what's the interpretation? Anyone? It can definitely, uh, it can definitely handle four hundred watts, but it can actually go. Okay, so I think I think you are referring to a slightly different point, which is your computer would have a power supply. That power supply will have a rating, which basically says this power supply can handle a load up to that. Whether your computer actually ever consumes that is a different story. Now, when you put a heavy-duty graphics card, sure, you're increasing that baseline. But now, let's say uh, I have a motherboard, and it says it consumes 100 watt. It doesn't always consume 100 watt, obviously, right? I mean, it's not 100 watt sustained. There is dependence upon workload and stuff like that, and manufacturers tend to be conservative. So the nameplate power consumption tends to be pretty conservative, okay? And now if you are designing a data center and you have N of these servers and you multiply your nameplate power by N uh, and then design your power distribution for that, you will have a lot of over-provisioning. And that over-provisioning multiplied by our inefficiency factor is going to basically, you'll be wasting a lot of power. So point is that the nameplate power consumption of the servers are way, way pessimistic because in reality, going back to most of the time our servers are idle, right? So real workloads do not use that power and certainly not all the servers simultaneously are kind of going to do that. 
So uh, if we were to purely design based upon the take back power, um, uh, you're you are basically going to be wasting, uh, you're going to be over provisioning, not only wasting dollars, but you're actually also going to get power. So this is an example uh, where some, I think it's an IBM uh, Blake server. Um, what you see out here is the name plate power of this guy is 308 watts. Um, whole bunch of different workloads, including uh, some arithmetic stuff and things like that. Okay, and what you see out here is that uh, even in the worst case, there is roughly a 50 to 60 watt gap out here. So, uh, and a lot of the time, obviously, you might be doing other other stuff where the load is less. So, uh, so so. Uh, Designing for the nameplate is not good. You kind of rely on statistical multiplexing somehow, and you have to make use of that. It's something uh, equivalent happens at our homes also. So, um, if you ever open your breaker panel, your breakers are probably rated at I don't know uh, 20 amp or 40 amp or something like that. But then they feed many, many, many outlets uh, at your home. Now, in, and each outlet is rated at 15 amp. So now you might say, okay, what if I plug 15 amp load on every outlet? Of course, you're going to exceed that, right? But they are designed with the assumption that you are never going to have all the loads active all the time simultaneously to kind of hit that. So, uh, so some degree of statistical multiplexing is always, uh, always kind of assumed. Uh, uh, so, uh, minimizing that, which is making use of statistical multiplexing. So a big part of data center design has been really playing these statistical games. That is, could I could I be a little bit more optimistic in the way we do it? So I'm paying for N servers, but I don't actually budget for nameplate power times N, but rather something lower. Um, so it's a bit like, uh, it's playing an economic uh, game basically, and there are all sort of other uh, things which Sort of people uh, also uh, begin to do, and there are uh, some some uh, some other motivations also. So, what ut uh, electric utility companies do is they price power based upon the peak power. So there is um, a very common model is the following: that they may bill you for number of watts you consumed multiplied by or some additive penalty factor which depends upon the highest current you drew during the billing period. So what it means is that if you and I consume the same amount of power, but you one day for a short period were running something pretty intense and I never did that, your rate would be much higher, okay? And the logic behind that is that uh, power company had to, to provide for that peak, they had to sort of create or uh, sustain some additional infrastructure, thicker cables, so and so and so forth, so they're going to put a penalty price on that. So that is another reason because of which uh, for a data center, it's good to keep the peak low, okay? Uh, so manage things so that you may have some reserve computing horsepower, but you keep your peak current, uh, peak current lower. So uh, what, uh, what, what is done is, and this is where sort of smart scheduling comes into play, which is you manage the workload within the data center, activating blades as needed, things like that, with these kind of go uh, goals in mind, okay? So essentially, uh, uh, manage the workload to, to keep your power profile something that is sustainable and efficient, taking into account all these things. So this generally goes into the concept of power provisioning. So when you provision for power, which basically means that when you design a system with a certain amount of power consumption in mind, you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay for it uh, with in the form of bigger uh, bigger cabling, bigger transformers, bigger PDUs, all those kind of things. So for each, uh, uh, this number, for each IT watt, namely uh, one watt delivered to the computing equipment, uh, the cost of that is some 10 to 20 dollars, okay, in the form of the share of this one watt uh, throughout that food chain. So uh, what that basically translates into is that every watt that you provision, if you amortize it over a 10 year period, uh, it's basically a couple of dollars, okay. 
so that's the fixed cost that you have to and then uh, on top of it you would have to uh, uh, on top of it you have to pay for actual power you are consuming uh, so these data centers buy power in bulk and also leverage some of the solar you can combine all of these things together they take we'll talk about PUE later but there is an efficiency factor and how much time it is up and running during the year you combine all of these things and you see that the running cost per year is around Model of the story out here, our provisioning cost is actually more than our running cost. So, uh, so if you could design your system so that you do not provision unless it runs, then purely from an economic perspective, uh, you are better off. In addition, uh, this has not even taken into account the extra power loss and all that we are going to do. So, uh, so, so. Uh, sizing things appropriately, don't over, not overpaying in terms of what you're uh, doing becomes important. So, a lot of work and a lot of research and I've seen faculty candidates in recent years kind of the thesis and all in these areas where they basically kind of have created very elaborate models of power consumption and cost modeling of data centers and things like that so that you can have some sort of a predictive kind of thing. How, how should you size a data center? What should you put in there and all? So, uh, sort of upfront cost, operating cost, all those kind of things come into play. So, um, yeah. So, part of the story, uh, what makes this thing work is that because of the statistical effect, workload varies and all, you always have what is called as an oversubscription opportunity. What it means is that I can over uh, or whatever, under design my system a little bit. I can over subscribe the system, taking into account the fact that not everything is going to be used all the time. And uh, in this particular case, uh, these numbers are from papers, basically at the rack level, there is maybe 5 to 10% opportunity. Uh, at the PDO level, power efficiency level, maybe a 20% opportunity. At the cluster level, uh, roughly a 30% opportunity. Another way of looking at it is for the same amount of power and therefore the cost, which we kind of saw earlier on, those numbers, same amount of power, I could host maybe 40% more machines. Okay, so uh, so you could add more machines than what normal, what would basically just go by a, a nameplate rating. So this concept of power over subscription has been part of the strategy. Uh, so uh, design, uh, so, so overall data center you want to operate uh, at the maximum capacity and not over design these uh, systems. So a related concept which comes up out here is something called power capping. So now that you have oversubscribed the system, you carry the danger that there might be times when your assumptions break down and you overload, your computing workload is such that you begin to exceed the true limits that exist. So power capping is this notion uh, that can I oversubscribe a circuit, a branch circuit breaker, uh, by having more servers than what it would normally permit, but do it in a safe fa fashion. So, in a home setting, uh, taking my bigger example, if you were to indeed put heavy loads on several outlets on the same circuit, your breaker will trip. Uh, but what exactly happens in the breaker? That hasn't happened before, but I don't know. Okay, so what happens? Someone? Come on, most of you are EE. Okay, so what's the most common type breaker? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so very, uh, so, so firstly, if you go really old days, I mean, I remember my home in India, there were not breakers, but what you call as fuses, okay, so that I'm sure you're constantly, I mean, our cars have fuses still, okay, so they're basically wires that melt, okay, and then 
Well, you cannot replace it. The breakers came later, and breakers basically, when they trip, as it's called, uh, then essentially is an electromagnetic thing which activates and separates the thing, and then you have to switch it back, very much like uh, the way things work for our um, uh, uh, these outlets in the kitchen which have the reset and test button, okay, so the GFCI things, okay, they're going to work on the same concept, so it's basically an electromagnetic switch, that's the way of thinking about it. Uh, and we'll come very shortly to that point because people have been playing tricks with the breakers also. But power over subscription is basically saying we are deliberately overloading our system because we don't want to pay for a costlier infrastructure behind the thing. I don't want to pay for uh, uh, just adding up all the watts of my servers because my servers are never active simultaneously. Uh, so I'm going to stress my system, but I want to do it in a safe fashion because I don't want the circuit to trip and all because bad things will happen. So then I, the way to do it is uh, this concept of power capping that we give servers a budget and we say, come what may, at this time you should not exceed this power. Okay, so uh, I mean, if you think about it, currently our computers have no such provision, right? I mean, if I throw more computing at it, it's going to burn more power, okay? And if it's nameplate power is 400 watt, maybe it will go up to that. But now that we are playing these games, so actually how much of my capacity, the power capacity I've allocated to a server becomes an issue and I have to make sure that that server never exceeds this thing. So on top of the stuff we discussed earlier, shutdown and scale uh, voltage frequency scaling and all, which was purely driven by performance requirements, now we also have a cap, which basically we tell a server that from now on, until I uh, update this thing, you, you shall not consume more than 200 watts. And some scheduler in the data center kind of parcels this thing out. And if you buy servers from uh, companies now, they often advertise this power capping capability. So power capping capability usually works in conjunction with some sort of a software package, uh, which would allocate, which will, so firstly, kind of some higher level optimizer will basically say, this is my sort of capacity out of this PDU, um, allocating it into these end servers in this particular way, and then we inform the power capping software on each one of those server uh, as to what their limits are. So there are many uh, companies which have their own proprietary ways of doing it, but deep down, it's basically at the hardware level, there is some sort of a policing entity which sits, and if the server starts hitting that power limit, then it slows things down. Be, uh, on whatever your OS may be saying, you know, it's going to override it because that's a hard power cap. Uh, because if you don't do that, and if other servers are starting doing the same thing, then basically the breaker will blow. So, so subs over subscribe, but do it in a safe fashion. So that's one. Then, so this this emerged. Then people said, you know, but we could be even smarter about this thing. So remember the breaker trips, and we just discussed how the breaker trip is, that they monitor the current and uh, they are going to activate this electromagnetic switch. Um, but let's say the breaker doesn't trip. Let's say the current exceeds. Then uh, bad things will happen. But there are always safety, it's not as if, like conceptually think of it this way, let's say I have a current waveform. Um, it's not as if I have a very high spike of current, but for a very short duration, maybe it's okay. But a higher spike which lasts for a long duration, I will have problems. So when the breakers trip, it's not simply the amount of current, but it's also the duration over which that tripping will happen. So I could play further game, a uh, little, like be living on the edge a little bit uh, more. What we can do is uh, actually even go beyond the rated limit, but watch and dial back before the breaker trips, okay? So uh, the idea is, again, I can get more juice out of the same infrastructure, and by the way, also have gain in dollar and gain in power, okay? So that's the more aggressive approach, that somehow you learn the tripping characteristics of the circuit breaker, and then oversubscribe even more aggressively, but while still kind of maintaining things in a safe, safe zone. So that's sort of thing that's happening out here. So these are breakers. Uh, and what, what you see out here is that depending upon uh, depending upon uh, uh, what the current is and uh, uh, what is the corresponding trip time that is, that is there was some 
main, main thing of the main thing. I can go higher current and the trip time is going to be shorter. I can go lower current, trip time is going to be longer. And of course, if the current is low enough, then it won't trip. So uh, learn these characteristics of the circuit and then you kind of make, make use of that. So you exploit knowledge of the circuit breaker and the actual server load and the current that you're drawing and then you play games with this thing. So I could you know, do a, be a little bit aggressive. So oversubscribe as long as the circuit breaker doesn't trip. That's basically the goal. So essentially what happens is a very you know, tight control loop which runs in these systems. Um, big knobs, um, one of the knobs that you exploit is a dynamic voltage frequency scaling. Um, uh, so you kind of keep manipulating it, of course, maintain thermal limits and all, but the idea is that you make sure that the circuit breaker will. So you can push things, but just long enough and go back before the breaker will trip. Um, these things make use ex extensive use of sensory instrumentations. Every these data centers, besides the computers, are kind of vast sensor networks. Every every aspect is being monitored, and also temperature and things like that, breaker characteristics, power of every little thing, and all. And then um, uh, then do that. And what they basically show is that by creating this kind of a circuit breaker adaptive system, they're able to oversubscribe quite nicely. Okay, so what that Again, translates into four dollars, as well as since you have a uh, lower wattage power infrastructure, so your wasted power is also less. So you can win out, win out both ways. So, uh, so this power, uh, so over subscription, power capping, these are things which are uniquely kind of data center kind of thing. This is not something you're going to find in our normal sort of uh, computing systems. In addition, of course. Uh, the data center systems also make use of all the power management methods that we kind of talk, talked about uh, earlier. So putting servers to sleep, virtualization, all those kind of things come into play. Um, another aspect that they play with for data centers is kind of the cost of power or how dirty the power is and things like that. So one big thing in case of data center, one control that they have is where to locate the data center. Uh, depending upon where you locate, that would have an influence on the type of power uh, that you are getting and also the type of cooling that you are getting. So uh, uh, things like sitting right next to a power plant or making use of renewable or getting free cooling. So for example, I was reading that, I think it's in Iceland, that they have these like an under, uh, data center, like servers which are running uh, underground or under, uh, like deep in the ice, and then they basically get the cooling for free. In fact, I think the article I was reading was, this was a company which had a whole bunch of these servers running, guess what, Bitcoin mining. So literally minting money. And uh, for them, the revenue was very important because if, it takes more to run the server than the uh, bitcoins that you are able to mine when you are in the negative. So for them, the cost was very, extremely important. But uh, more seriously, though, since cooling is again a third of the cost, so if you can get that for free, that's great. Um, and then we already saw things like, uh, like how perhaps heat could be recycled and stuff like that. And a lot of these things are moving targets. I mean, cost of power, things like that, they kind of change with other exchange of factors. Uh, but data center location is uh, kind of a big thing. And part of the reason also is that running a data center costs a lot of money that you are paying for power. So uh, power efficiency in these cases is not simply kind of a feel good thing, but actually uh, real, real dollars behind it. So, uh, what other ways do you think you can, yeah. so for a moment, let's ignore the sustainability goal. I just want to minimize uh, my cost of power. So what all games can you play? So I, uh, I'm not interested in reducing power consumption. Maybe uh, like I have to consume power, I have to do some work. 
uh, but I want to do it in a cheaper fashion and maybe I also want to do it in a leaner fashion. Okay, so what kind of things? Okay, so I can distribute the workload to a different data center, but uh, so, so that's a good example, but you, uh, you're not touching upon all the benefits that that can accrue. So let's say I want to explore ability to move the workload around. I mean, all these data centers of, let's say, Google, they're interconnected, right? So the data and work can be moved around. Let's say, uh, there were no other legal or other factors. What kind of advantages for power do you see with that? Just one server in one location being heavily underutilized and so much all the work that that would Okay, but that is a computing story. I'm talking about a power story. So do you think a power consumed here in LA and a power consumed in New York right now, like, are they the same or not? In what way would they differ? By power consumed, I mean, let's say I draw an amp for a minute or whatever, some, like, uh, what changes? What, what all? Okay, so what, what does it affect? Right, so if I'm, if I'm Google running the data center, what, what difference would I see? Right, 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 but what, what would it affect? I mean, ultimately, yes, you're right, all, all these factors are important, but I'm trying to, uh, so what would I see? Like, I'm interacting with the electric utility. It's giving me an amp here, sitting in LA. It's giving me an amp if I'm in New York. Now, prices would differ, okay? So that's one. Uh, so prices would differ because they might price it based upon the demand they have, right? So if there's too much demand at the time in location one, the price there would be higher. So I could move my work to a place where I'm currently seeing a lower price, okay? So that's one, okay? What else can differ? What other characteristic of electricity might matter? I can use it from, as you said, like from a greener source. From a greener source. So uh, when the load on the grid increases, the additional resources we activate are usually the dirtier ones. Okay. So, so, uh, so if I am, again, in the game of carbon credits and stuff like that, if I kind of I'm caring about that, then again, it would be better to go places where the current energy mix is greener than the mix. So, so moving workload is something uniquely, something that IT, IT information technology can do very easily. It's not something like I can do for moving my laundry load from one place to another, but sort of virtual loads you can move, right? So, so this, this, this concept of um, arbitraging prices and arbitraging green, green, Greenliness of the energy is something that sort of uh, gets uh, played out quite a bit. So, uh, fluctuating in electricity prices. Um, uh, so, the way electricity prices work is there are markets basically, and sometimes those markets get manipulated as they were from like 10 years ago or so. Uh, when you begin to have huge spikes and stuff like that. But uh, essentially, what happens is there are suppliers, there are um, just kind of the generators, and then there are users, which are uh, essentially our utility companies, which are buying power to deliver to us. And they are basically in a continual game. Uh, utility companies have to estimate how much power they will need. Uh, generators have to kind of estimate these games. They have to price things because if the price is too high, then people will not use it. If the price is too low, uh, then they uh, lose, lose the profit. So. Uh, po power consumption changes, uh, oh, sorry, uh, prices change for a bit, so this particular case, Portland, Richmond, 
Virginia, Houston, Texas, Palo Alto, and you kind of see uh, that this is happening. It's literally like the stock market, okay, for, for, for commodities, energy, okay? And then there are various kind of prices. There are prices which are immediate prices. You can buy energy on what is called a spot market, and then you can buy day ahead, okay? So you kind of project things out for the next 24 hours, and on that basis kind of make a contract for something that I'm going to need so much energy next day, and you can purchase it. And so there are markets operating at different uh, different, uh, different scales. So electricity prices have both temporal and geographical variation. They change from location to location, and they change at the same location over time. Um, so, and like I said, there's a spot market and there is a futures market. So essentially data centers, because they are such big consumers, they play this game uh, quite quite nicely. So they exploit variations in the electricity pricing. They didn't used to, but there was a pretty influential work out of, uh, I think it was MIT and Berkeley, kind of these guys published a paper a few years ago, which kind of showed that this had a lot of promise and all, and so sort of that idea kind of got picked up. So essentially, shift. Shifting workload across time was something that people have advocated for a long while. Okay, like that is something you can do even at a local scale because if you are seeing a temporal variation, then you can do things uh, differently. And in fact, that's what this concept of demand response has been about, which is uh, prices change, then we uh, try to get the consumers to shift the load. But this kind of shift load, shifting workload across space, is something that. Uh, data centers can do easily, particularly of these big organizations that can kind of shift work, work, work load back and forth. So uh, what they do is, I mean, already they do data replication, already they do uh, sort of reroute requests to different uh, different places to, to as a load balancing, and also a lot of computational mechanisms are already or were already in place and so this is going to be. Uh, there are additional constraints, like for example, latency is a constraint. Um, uh, yeah, other constraints which come up also are sometimes legal and all. So it could be like uh, government may say that never move this data out of the country, for example. Those kind of constraints may be there, but even with that, there is a fair bit of uh, flexibility around, and uh, one could uh, one could. Make, make use of that. So essentially, um, uh, this class of work uh, makes, makes use of that and kind of shows that being able to move uh, things across the region and all ends up saving money. So, overall, then uh, uh, the story on the data center side is that there is. Uh, on the power side is that there's a lot of opportunity in terms of playing these games, the variations that exist, uh, the fact that you are mostly not using the peak power and therefore with the same infrastructure you can carry more uh, computation. So uh, the redundancy is always there, so you're kind of paying for a switch, it's, it's, it's important to kind of minimize the effects of these kind of run more servers of the same infrastructure. Um, uh, as data centers are able to use renewables and local batteries and things like that, there are even more complex complex processes uh, that happen. Uh, other stuff which also happens because these data centers are such big users, they, unlike you and me, where we kind of use the energy and the meter bill, the utility just bills us, that's not how these guys work. They buy energy, and so like they buy so much energy for use in a certain time period. So they have to manage energy as kind of a source. Uh, so there's a lot of complexity out here. Some of it obviously is about energy efficiency, but a lot of it is also about economics. Uh, minimize because energy use is a dollar and cents issue for these these companies. So so that's the power system side of things. Then uh, the other big portion in these things is of the cooling infrastructure. So as we talked earlier, cooling consumes another roughly a third of the power. So uh, if you look at the cooling system of these data centers, there's a lot of, uh, essentially they're like very highly optimized HVAC systems, the kind of stuff we see in these buildings and also they have 
room level air conditioning, they have chill water, uh, water tillers, water pumps, cooling towers, a lot of different kind of technologies which are kind of, kind of have been brought to bear on this. The very common uh, architecture for cooling that emerged in uh, early on in the data system industry is the raised floor type data system, where essentially kind of the idea is that these uh, room level AC units, they cool the air, they push the air under the floor, it comes out uh, in a pile, flows through the rat, and then the hot air goes in the neighboring aisles, and then it rises up, all it to be sucked in, and that cycle keeps going. So the aisles are alternating between hot and cold, and there are outlets on the floor through which sort of the air gets pushed, and then it might go through it, and then you know, of course fans and these things. Um, now, looking at this, as you might immediately uh, imagine, that the cooling part is not going to be the same. Like, if you look at like a rack like this, a server at the bottom, a server in the middle, and a server at the top is not going to see the same level of cooling efficiency. So, uh, this adds to our variation mix, and as we saw, the temperature that we will sustain is going to affect the power consumption. So the same task running, if let's say I had all the servers on this rack idle, the same task running on different locations in the rack is going to have a different energy footprint. So managing that sort of becomes an issue. So what happens from a scheduling perspective is that you kind of try to understand the cooling characteristics of the whole system and based upon that map the tasks to servers and see sort of what, what would happen. So the cooling system itself becomes pretty complicated. Uh, the C racks are like essentially like grand versions of our uh, home and room AC units. Um, uh, cold air, like 15 to 20 degrees C. Um, and you also make use of kind of study the thermal characteristics of the rack. Do not let one server get very hot because that will affect Cooling is critical because if things heat up, then uh, bad things happen. And basically, cooling fails, data center would fail in a matter of seconds. Uh, so, therefore, cooling is backed up by uh, uh, generators and energy sources. Um, rough, roughly a third to 40% of the cost is cooling related. So, quite, uh, quite a big sort of role that cooling plays, and of course, cooling takes energy. So burning energy on the IT side, and then you're burning energy on removing that heat, which sort of takes a bit of energy. So there are many variety of systems. Uh, chilled water type systems are very common. Um, uh, chilled water loops is how cooling is done in our buildings also. A week or so ago, if you recall, we went through this phase where engineering building had the AC turned off because there was a big hole in the water, chilled water pipe, which comes to the engineering cluster. So essentially what happens is that there is a water chiller which sends out cool water that goes to these uh, room level AC units in effect, uh, which are circulating the air. So this thing is um, uh, cooling that air and then the hot, warmer, warm water goes back to the chiller and again kind of the whole thing is happening over there. And in case of the UCLA, we have big chilling plants so like um, I think there's one which is on parking lot nine, for example. You see that uh, the eastern end of parking lot nine, there's a big unit out there. Uh, so, so that's that's how these things work. Pretty standard. A lot of homes also have similar kind of stuff for big buildings, certainly. Frequent, yeah, go ahead. Yes, they do. So, in fact, part of the reason you also cool is because of. Actually, AC itself dehumidifies the air. Okay, remember the water is not going into water. It's not as if water coils are coming into the room at all. They are going to kind of the C rack unit. Okay, and then it comes in from there. Uh, uh, but condensation and electronics is something to do to minimize. One other thing I was reading is that they have basically also found again talk about over provisioning. So uh, it turns out that 
a lot of these things like what temperature to keep at and all have basically been uh, things that historically people have used but they have also done experiments do we really need this level of cooling and all and it turns out that actually you can slack off and nothing bad happens okay so there's a fair bit of margin built into these systems uh, that could be made use of free cooling that's another one obviously uh, that could I uh, could we make use of nature's cooling ability uh, so cool air outside, like I was referring, under under ice and hot cycle, uh, these kind of places. The airflow management is also very important because if you do it properly, you can have a more efficient system. So some of these aspects of data centers have over time, uh, everyone has converged to the same common architecture to roughly standardize at this stage. Um, particular airflow, how much airflow you need for server, so on and so forth. All of these things are very carefully designed and there are very specialized simulators which do essentially uh, uh, differential equation type analysis for the whole data center to kind of model these effects and all. Okay. Um, when there is not enough airflow, then basically what will happen is air pressure will drop, server fans will uh, have to work harder, and then uh, over time what we, uh, what we begin to see is it affects the server performance. Uh, so in this particular case, it's a system power consumption and uh, sort of it's uh, dependent on uh, how sort of uh, the airflow affects it. So the idea is as the airflow goes down, I'm not cooling the system properly for the same load, the system power consumption is going down. So you have to kind of keep these things in balance because you may save and you may seek to save energy by having a lower airflow or a less cold air, but then you are going to waste energy on this side of things. So these things have to be kind of balanced out very carefully. So all of this stuff gets done by then a very careful modeling exercise. And this is where sort of folks on mechanical engineering side come into play. Uh, so they use kind of fluid flow analysis and stuff like that. Literally kind of do a whole data center analysis. Um, they are a specialized wireless sensor, companies that make specialized wireless sensor networks and all to do this kind of monitoring. So they put these sensor nodes, sometimes they are actually part of the plates themselves. Um, collect all this data, do continual modeling, do adaptation and change the airflow accordingly or shift workload. If you see a hot pot developing on one of the racks, well, move that workload around to a different rack in a different part of the data center. So a lot of this stuff is, so, so there is an initial model and design component, but then there is also uh, continually measure and adapt sort of component out here. And all of this links back to the way you where should a job run, when should it run, those kind of scheduling questions and so forth. So, yeah, uh, modeling of the thermal part and all. So, uh, from a computational side, what has begun to happen is, so it's no, uh, not simply dynamic voltage frequency scaling, dri dri uh, driven by timing constraints and all, it is now also uh, integrated with thermal management, integrated with the cooling service as well. Uh, so you deploy temperature sensors and then you apply the model uh, on how to control let's say the fan speeds and all and then that's an additional knob to you so you uh, do your data center wide tasks mapping and scheduling taking into account the power consumer namely your IT equipment and the power consumer namely your cooling equipment and the effect the cooling is having on the IT equipment you kind of do all of this in a very integrated manner so as you can imagine pretty complicated set of tasks a lot of other innovations have also been happening. So things like liquid cooling of racks and all these, these kind of things are also coming up. Of course, uh, more complicated. Water cooling of chips, um, that's another one. So instead of just heat sinks and all, you uh, put uh, coolants right next to the chip. Uh, and all of these things, I mean, uh, have their own efficiencies and all that you have to sort of worry about. Um, 
dynamic things like dynamic fan control and all is also something actually you will find in like your desktop PCs and all. Uh, the issue is not so much power there. The issue is something uh, more interesting, namely uh, noise. Because if you have the fan running all the time, it's a pretty annoying thing. So uh, the fan kicks in so, so that you can have a quieter sort of uh, work environment. Laptops also, same thing. The fans are not always running. They run to keep the ambient noise level just down. OK, so uh, um, that brings us to after we put all of these things, how do we characterize a data center? Like how efficient is it? Uh, when you compare data centers together, what does it mean? So there is, uh, you, you, you saw this thing called PUE in one of the earlier slides. So the way, uh, the way uh, uh, efficiency of data centers is measured or defined is in terms of that second PUE, which is basically the power, total facility power divided by the IT equipment power. Okay, so it's basically saying that you have IT equipment consuming 100 watts, and if to run that I needed 200 watts, then my PUE is 2. Okay, and a higher PUE is a bit bad. So uh, that yeah, you can translate that into efficiency. Do you think it's a good metric? And if you were purchasing a data center, uh, would you go by PUE? And you could find it for a computer, right? I mean, uh, so power burnt by the computer versus overall power delivered to the computer. Uh, so the difference is, of course, the cooling and the losses in the power system, right? So uh, my question basically is that uh, is PUE a good metric? Okay, yeah, but that's just a reputation. Uh, it would be bad if the IT equipment power is bad to begin with. Right. So it's the point. Uh, point it is missing out on this thing. It's not telling you how. If, I mean, you don't really care about IT equipment power. You care about the work it is doing, right? I mean, so really, what the ultimate metric that matters is how many watts or how many dollars I'm spending to get my work done. Okay, and this is giving me only part of that part of that story. Okay, so PUE is good, but the assumption out here is I'm looking at data center where the IT equipment is equally efficient. That is, if it consumes a watt and does a MIPS, it's the same everywhere, okay? But that doesn't have to be. There are, obviously, uh, you could do optimizations there as well. So, uh, uh, PUE, you can kind of flip it around and come up with the efficiency, and you can use this thing for the total cost of ownership, for sort of example. Um, so PUE of like nowadays data centers their PUE is pretty close to one. Okay, they uh, like they have brought things down quite significantly. Uh, it used to be like three, four, five. Okay, and now it's like one point something. Okay, so uh, they have they have improved sort of quite a bit. Um, uh, best possible PUE is of course one, which basically means that uh, my cooling and uh, power efficiencies have all gone down to zero, okay? Um, now, there is another way of thinking about also uh, out here is uh, um, uh, that uh, total facility power, this is a little bit ambiguous also, which is what if I generated my own power, okay? Does that matter, like if I have a solar panel? So uh, in that case, should be counted there or not? I mean, it could still be misleading. So if you look in terms of the societal footprint, uh, that should probably be power which is sourced from external means or dirty means, uh, not necessarily otherwise. So there are uh, PUEs which are now, like I said, pretty close to one. So as you can imagine, they are very, very efficient. Sorry, very, very efficient. Uh, so like Facebook has one in Oregon, okay. A um, uh, lot of interesting stuff uh, sort of going on, uh, going on with this thing. Um, so, uh, 
so that it has built-in solar arrays and stuff like that. Uh, the other one, which in recent years received a lot of attention, was Apple's uh, one in North Carolina, and there are big solar panels and stuff like that. I mean, it's kind of uh, essentially they're trying to head into an area where they're essentially self-contained, so they are not even kind of dependent upon any external infrastructure. Um, so lots of uh, lots of um, uh, sort of improvements in uh, recent years, and as you can see, lead gold and lead platinum. So there is a lot of like they are rated and they are evaluated along along uh, different dimensions also. Let's see what else I wanted to say out here. Okay, so uh, so overall, what's happening in these data centers then is have electrical power coming in. Um, I have stuff being wasted in the cooling system. I have stuff being wasted in the power system. Uh, then I have the IT equipment, uh, which is roughly, uh, let's say, uh, used to be a third. Now, obviously, it's a lot, a lot higher. And then there has wasted heat. And uh, so efficiency, uh, there effi uh, efficiency galore, uh, efficiency mechanisms everywhere. The cooling system efficient, I can make this efficient. I can make the IT equipment efficient. I can recycle the heat. Uh, that's another option that sort of we have. So back to efficiency metrics, PUE has to be used very carefully. Uh, so uh, one, generally speaking, has to uh, uh, has to take into account uh, uh, various aspects because otherwise you can have an artificially High, sorry, artificially good PUE uh, uh, or, or other way around, it could be that your energy consumption is reduced, uh, but the PUE may increase. Okay, so for example, uh, this particular case, the server fans are no longer required, so IT equipment power went down, therefore the PUE went up, even though you are actually consuming less power. Okay, so. PUE is kind of a uh, metric which has to be used a little bit uh, carefully. So there are other metrics which are also used. There is one which is the following, which actually in some senses kind of makes sense. Amount of computational work divided by total energy use. Okay, uh, that's something one would care about. The problem is this is not a perfect metric either. Uh, why is that? Let's imagine it, it's amount of computational work is really rate of computational work. It doesn't include how the work scales. So you guys have never bought a computer and bothered looking for benchmarks and all. I mean, you can pick a benchmark and show computer A is better than B or vice versa, right? I mean, it depends upon the benchmark you select. Uh, so the problem is this thing is very hard to define. I mean, for what? I mean, you seem to be a gaming fan. You probably look for something different than, let's say, someone doing scientific computing. And right. So, so the thing is that um, this is easier said than done. And data centers obviously are general purpose things. So there is no single workload. So that would be pretty hard either. Um, uh, these folks from Google, sort of, they had proposed this. So you basically look at one over PUE or one over SPUE or metric and multiplied by this computation over total energy to electronic components. So they kind of um, combine. Uh, so PUE is pa uh, power consumed by the data center, power delivered to the server. This is power delivered to the server, power consumed by the electronics, multiplied by computation divided by the power delivered to the electronics. So you take all of this together, it's basically This computing efficiency, IT equipment efficiency, and the building facilities efficiency. Kind of, those are the three metrics that you are kind of looking at. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so state of so server power efficiency is basically saying that look, uh, how much power within the server within the computer goes into things which really are not advancing the cause of computation. They are basically being wasted. Just 
motors of the drive and then the uh, power supply unit and stuff like that. So again, sort of significant losses that happen out there also. There are, uh, so again, uh, these different metrics basically that we floated around. Okay. Um, since data centers use uh, energy which is locally sourced also, so one has to somehow also incorporate that because otherwise they, uh, th there's clearly, if I give you two data centers which are consuming same amount of power and doing the same amount of work, but one makes use of grid energy and the other just solar energy, um, clearly there's something better about the second one. So uh, that affects uh, this formula of total facility power minus energy reuse or something from renewables. So one has to do that. And uh, take into reward data centers which are kind of doing that. So that's another metric which is coming up. Computing efficiency is by far the hardest to measure. Um, uh, there are things, there are benchmarks which have emerged in recent years which spec specifically seek to quantify power efficiency. So for the longest while, benchmarks were solely about performance, like uh, you would see all these things. Uh, um, I mean, spec was one of the earliest benchmarks to it, but there are many others. Uh, they test various kind of things, your graphic system, your storage system, your IO and things like that, but they, it was always about performance. Uh, uh, power efficiency was less important, but in recent years, power related benchmarks have also emerged. So for example, Joule sort is one which has the place lies. It looks at sorting operation. Okay, and it basically looks at sorting large data sets of records. And kind of the idea is that um, it's a task which is very commonly done, and it exercises every part of the system. But there are other, other, um, uh, there are other um, uh, benchmarks in the same vein that power as an So anyway, so. Benchmarking stuff is happening quite a bit. Dual sort is being one example. Spec power is the other. So it's a broad order of work, uh, workloads, uh, sort of Java based, and it has average system power, performance power ratio, divide the two, come up with a number. And the idea is that you can use this thing to rate different servers uh, from a power efficiency perspective. Okay, so. Um, uh, So uh, there are uh, additional requirements that of course data center has to uh, sustain also. So it's not simply about lowering the power because I can always lower the power and not meet the other requirements. So uh, operating cost, the performance level, and all, all these things also become important. And uh, so a lot of work which basically is happening is uh, doing the power management in a fashion that uh, these other requirements are uh, met as well. So uh, driving all of this has been, so this is uh, this is the plot I have shown very early in the course. So this was out from Google, like, uh, uh, the two names I have given in one of the earlier slides. Uh, but basically, a lot of power management and all has been driven by this observation that most of the time uh, we are over-provisioned, very, Little time the servers are active, most of the time they are out there, or they are actually idle. And therefore, making things idle work very efficiently is important. Okay, so I'm going to skip these because we have looked at this, this stuff. Um, one big driver uh, has been the virtualization technology. So. Since part of the data center operation is being able to move around workloads very rapidly from one blade to another blade and all, so the technology that helps out there is this virtualization uh, technology, the idea being that we have uh, some sort of an emulated machine and then we can move the emulated machine across different blades and uh, in response to pooling events and things like that or perhaps even across different data centers. Uh, it also gives us the opportunity to consolidate things. So. Nowadays, it's very common that when you buy a server in the cloud, you're really buying a virtual machine, which is 
uh, parcel out to you. So uh, that technology is playing a very big role. A part of the problem which comes with virtualization is that when you are running in a virtualized thing, it's very hard to estimate how much power you are consuming. So you are running inside a VM, that VM is being sh is sharing a physical server with other VMs. So, and that physical server is the one which is consuming the power. So a uh, fair bit of work in recent times on doing power estimation and the splitting of power across these different VMs uh, nicely. So VM itself has come up with its own challenges, uh, uh, which sort of affect things. Um, final bit, so if you look at what's happening in these systems is, I mentioned along the way that there are these sensors and things like that. So all of these are coming together into essentially this very complicated runtime control system where uh, you sense the workload, you sense the thermal characteristics, you control where the tasks are running, and you control all the cooling system around it. And it's a, uh, this kind of a model-based uh, real-time control which is happening. So in terms of sensors, uh, power, temperature, performance, stability, things like that. In terms of actuators, you can regulate dynamic voltage frequency scaling, you can manage the CPU, you can manage your cooling system, and things like that. And models and control strategies kind of help drive this thing. So there are commercially, there are these, uh, when you buy servers and all now from companies like IBM or uh, HP or things like that, they actually send, sell, sell uh, they give you these essentially management software where you, a key part is actually the energy management. So it used to be that system management basically made the server down and stuff like that. Now, all this sensor data feeds into these um, centralized software which basically then control things. So power capping, how much of my power budget goes to these servers and all those kind of things. So IBM has a product called like, for example, uh, systems director, active energy manager, things like that. Whole bunch of sensors. So this is the example from IBM system, the kind of sensors they have on chip integration system, on chip analog system, critical path monitor, these monitoring to see uh, how well am I doing on voltage board level power, board level temperature sensors, uh, memory controller activity, whole bunch of stuff is there. Intel puts a lot of these things as what they call as performance counters, which again give you an insight on what the system is doing. Uh, power supplies have become very uh, important, so uh, being able to affect them. So the good old simple power supply in our PCs and all, by the time they hit these servers, they're actually all network connected, all their parameters could be configured and changed and all. So they're part of this uh, complicated feedback, uh, feedback kind of uh, loop that happens. Okay, uh, memory system, same story. Uh, storage, same story. And go like that, I'm gonna be skipping a lot of the slides. So uh, jumping uh, basically to the conclusion. So what's happening in these servers uh, basically is that this is a lot of this runtime control, sense, actuate, uh, multi-dimensional control of not just computing and all of these things coming together. Uh, there is no one element that you can specifically focus on. So it's overall, you're designing essentially a very customized building which have and computer kind of together. Uh, there is increasingly a lot of burden on software to manage this and that has begun to reflect on the kind of software services these companies kind of provide. Uh, in our pricing and all, uh, now increasingly like pricing which is based upon how much energy your your particular task is consuming, those kind of factors are also coming in. Um, and a lot of these technologies have begun to kind of also affect the way our low-end computers, the kind of servers that we buy and all also do. So a lot of these things like cool, dynamic cooling management, thermal management and all, they grew out of data centers, but they kind of are also used in our low-end devices at this stage. So uh, I'm gonna stop uh, here, but uh, data centers probably represent kind of the most sophisticated end of uh, power management, where bringing together all, all these uh, different elements together.